Now tell me the difference between a, a tailor and a cutter. Because you, you create the costume yeah. sketch and then deliver it to... Well, the, the, the term cutter is usually, usually reserved for women's clothing. We talk about cutters who, who, and first hands, etc., and assistants and sewers, etc. That's all on the women's teams. A tailor is usually talked about in men's clothing. But you can have a tailor working in women's clothing. For example, if you were to do a, a, um, a, uh, a, a 19th century riding costume for a woman, that jacket is tailored, has to be right. tailored. It's not, it's not draped. It's not cut the way you would cut a, a dress or anything like that. It's, it's tailored. You've got all kinds of things with women that men don't have that need to be tailored properly, you know. So the, so the, so usually, and, and it's funny, I don't use my men's tailor to go over and do the women's tailoring. I'll use a woman who can cut and tailor properly for, for that. And where do they learn that? Because it's an art, ah, right? Ah, now mean? listen, we've just, you've just opened up the largest can of worms in the, in the industry right now. The tailors are not there anymore. The, the great tailors have been trained in Europe. And the old, the old apprenticeship programs, the tailor at the Shaw Festival, Vincenzo Cardoni, who just retired, we brought him back out of retirement, not to, to just make the clothing, but to teach because we've got four or five people who want to be tailors but don't know where to go to get the training. No, it's a shortage. It's a desperate shortage. Theater Aquarius, screaming for a tailor, you know, so all over the place. How do the old tailors, how do they train and how do we bring that Well, I will use Vincenzo. I don't think he would mind me saying so. He was trained in Italy at Torino. He had an apprenticeship program there where he had to start, you know, probably sweeping the floor for a year. You know, that, that old world apprenticeship program. And eventually when he graduated, he had to cut a piece of clothing. And that piece of clothing was adjudicated by a whole series of very respectable tailors. And then at the end, he got his graduation certificate. Then the next step up was he cut and tailored some clothing for somebody else and he was adjudicated on that and he got what he calls the Academy Award for for men's clothing. Then he came to Canada. But it's an art, it's not a science, so... It's both, but it is an art. And it is an does art. He, where, does, where does he learn the art of it? He, is it in he, him? I mean, he, is it in, in him, him most likely he... it's in his spirit, of course. You know, he, he, if you don't have the feel for it, if you don't have the eye for it, you know, it doesn't matter how, all the training in the world, it's not going to help you become a great tailor. So what does that mean, to have the feel for it? it well, it's like... like cooking or anything you've got to you've just got to feel it and it doesn't mean necessarily feeling it with your fingers but you feel it in your soul that yes you look at it and it's it's what you want to do it's it, that you have to do in some ways you're you're driven to do it you know but these most of these people have come back come from um, a tradition right. uh, you know a lot of the tailors that I've known have been tailors you know, uh, in the old country or in England or wherever, and they've come through, and their father was a tailor before that. You know, I just heard the story the other day on the radio about the, the, the uh, milliner in, in Montreal, you know, who, last of the hat makers in Canada, who's still making hats. You go in there, you want a hat, I give you a hat, $15, you know. Uh, we'll still make you a hat by hand, uh, you know. And I don't know anybody, or there used to be some people on Spadina Street here that would make hats by hand. They're, they're gone. So creating a perfect suit is in fact a form of physical flattery? I would think so, of course. You want them to look good. The little story with Vincenzo, the first time he ever cut a suit for me. I said to him, you know, Vincenzo, I want this suit. I didn't know him that well at that time. I said, I want this suit done really well because you've got to do it right before I can do it wrong. Oh, yes, of course. He says, of course. But he didn't understand what I really meant was, you build me the perfect suit, I'm taking it out in the parking lot, and I'm dragging it around behind a Volkswagen Beetle all over the town to break it down. And then come back. And he's just shocked when he saw these suits that he'd perfectly made broken down. But I said, if he hadn't done it perfectly, if he had taken shortcuts, the thing would have fallen apart. Right. 
because it, it uh, would, you know. So if you build, say, uh, Taylor goes along and says, oh, he's going to break it down, just uh, don't do this and don't do that, take a short. Well, in the breaking down, to make breakdown look proper, you, the, the suit could fall apart. Right. <laughs> and a cutter. Yeah. How do they learn? Well, women's cutting, um, there's a less of a problem in that a particular area. There's, there's more women want to be in the fashion industry and in and cutting than men wanting to go into tailoring. And that's a fact. How do they learn? Well, there are schools, like there are tailoring schools too, but they're mostly in Europe, but there are schools in Europe that, that you can go to the, what's called the tailor and cutters and et cetera, et cetera, schools and learn your trade there, you know. But you have to have a certain level of competence before you even start. Right. And there's certain schools where you learn draping, certain schools where you learn actual cutting. What we're doing here now in Canada, and a lot, most of the major theater companies are doing, is that you're taking really talented young people who start out as sores in the theater for a year, work their way up, and maybe end up being a first hand for two, three years. I've got one, one young girl right now who's been a first hand for about three to four years with one of our more senior cutters. A first hand is someone who works, works with directly the with the cutter. With directly with the cutter. In other words, the cutter cuts the clothing, lays it out, and gives it to the first hand. The first hand will designate the work to all the sewers, etc. The first hand is in, in the fitting room right. with, the, with the cutter. In some cases, some cutters don't like their first hands in the fitting room. That's a, that's a, a, a choice. But this, this young girl is now graduated up and she's cutting on her own and she's doing a beautiful job of it. She's young, so that, that part of that team is, is there. The other cutter is, is, did the same thing. The girl she learned from, learned from another cutter who's retired now. Interestingly enough, the thread of that first cutter has gone through two generations of cutters. And you can tell in the clothing how they approach their work. Who taught them? How? The waist, the shoulder, the neck? The way, the drape. The, yeah, all of that. All of, all of the above. Some, some cutters are drapers, like to drape, some don't. Some are pattern, what they call pattern cutters, you know. Um, it's, uh, it, it's just the way they approach the detail, the, the way the, the clothing is put together more than anything else. Is, uh, is how, they, uh, how you know where they've come from. And how difficult is it then with tailors and cutters with modern fabrics as opposed to traditional? What I call fruit salad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, fabrics that are fruit salad that dull your scissors when you're trying to cut through them. Um, good fabrics are, are a boon to, uh, to, to a good garment. There's no doubt about that, especially in men's tailoring. Good fabrics really good fabrics will give you a better look because they tailor better. Bad synthetic fabrics, the kind of things like the hockey players are wearing, um, they, they don't tailor very well. They really don't. Many of them have no substance to them. They're too thin, right. you see. And some of the older fabrics, like for example for tuxedos or for formal wear, whenever you use a fabric called Barathea, it comes out of Britain, it's a wool. Oh, it's to die for. Making a military jacket, you, you use, you can't get these Milton that you used to be able to get, which was the very thin Milton wool that the military jackets were made of. Nowadays, it's more reserved for like coats and that. It's too th heavy, too thin. Right, right. But every once in a while, you'll find somewhere in Toronto and at some shelf somewhere, a proper Milton. And boy, you grab it when you do it because it, it's, no, nobody's wearing that stuff anymore and it's all based on the market. You know. I heard a story from Opera Atelier in Dora Rusti that someone had a store of, of period fabrics in Detroit or something. I mean, they were literally, whatever, 150 years old. Mm -hmm. And they gave them to Opera Atelier saying, you know, here are fabrics from yeah, you great. can't get now. It's fabulous. It really is fantastic when that happens. Uh, Back in 1980, I guess it was, uh, the head of wardrobe at that time, she and I were out, and I was looking for Victorian trims. 
you can't find the Victorian trims anymore. You mean the laces? Oh, and the lace and the baubles and all that sort of stuff that you find. Oh, what, the zhuzh, I call it, on, on a Victorian dress. You can't find a lot of that. What, it, what you're basically we use nowadays are, are drapery trims, like curtain baubles and stuff like that. We put them on the clothing. In fact, a lot of drapery fabrics are used in clothing because they're closer to the period stuff than what you get on the shelf. Well, anyway, there was a lady phoned up. She had overheard us talking, I guess it was, and we were in Hamilton. She phoned up and said that she had, she was a milliner, I guess it was, or, or a, a cutter, I'm not quite sure, a, a dressmaker. And she had cases of trims that her mother had stored. So Rita went out, had a look at it and just about fell over. There was boxes and boxes of Victorian trims, silk and all oh, beautiful stuff. Um, moire trims in moire and what have you. Oh, it was amazing. So we, we crossed her palms with sorted coinage and took these boxes. Do you know that there's still some of those trims are on the shelf at the shop festival? I mean, wow. it, it just it, it went on. We just used them. It, every once in a while, that happens. Wow. And we have another little saying, too. That, when it's 2009 in Toronto, it's 1959 in Hamilton. And that's, that's because Ottawa Street, which has turned into one of the great fabric streets in Ontario, where all the theatre companies are going there to shop, is pick, uses 90% remnants from all over North America. And those remnants can be 10, 20, 30 years old. Right. And you can find the most amazing stuff. Plus the the, the ethnic composition of Hamilton, the kinds of fabrics you see there, many of them are old world. And it's just a gold mine, an absolute gold mine to, to shop on Ottawa Street.